Hey you guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week we are going to be sharing our top tips for growing your best garden ever. Ooh, that's a good one. This year can be the year you guys. So come join us in the Harvest Kitchen and we'll throw it all out there for you. Right. Well, welcome back to the Harvest Kitchen. Yep. What's going on? What you been up to? <laughs> um, you know, this time of year is kind of this odd transition time where we're going Absolutely. from kind of deep winter. It's snowy. It's gray, and then you start seeing things start melting off, and I start getting really antsy for spring. But it's way too early around here in North Idaho to get excited about spring yet. <laughs> <laughs> it just like is it leads down a bad road because sure enough it's going to snow again so i have been trying to uh, turn my mind towards what i can keep getting done in the house and so i've been working on some household systems and um, really trying to upgrade my household management uh, i you know when you are running a household that is a producing productive household and everybody's home all day it's a really different scenario than running a household where everybody's gone all day and you're just kind of you know a consumer household where you're just going and buying everything that right. you need and bringing it in um, and so that means you have to have a lot more systems for that production in place and you can always get better and more efficient at your system so I'm kind of trying to work out a few places where we've had you know maybe not the most efficiency things that okay. need to upgrade and change and so uh, always working on that actually i'm really excited because i think this week we're sharing a new video with you guys where i'm talking a little bit about some of the things that i do to manage your productive yeah you, get a, you get a lot of questions on like, that we get a and, lot that, of and that, that is that's a hard one to discuss and to display right you can't just do a how-to on that not really yeah, yeah that's more challenging but it is. but i'm excited and i think they'll be excited that you're gonna you're looking for ways to start talking about that right a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sharing those things. So. Now, I got to say, you have been out shopping, though. <laughs> okay, so we are a little bit of a consumer family, <laughs> especially when it comes to the antique store. <laughs> That's a dangerous place, you know that? Oh, man, I know. I, I, I try not to go in there. I have fun going in there. Oh. Whether it's finding you the largest Dutch oven in the world. Right. Or just some really great old tools. He found me this Dutch oven, and it easily holds four of our giant chickens, like six-pound chickens, four of them. Yeah, except for I she can't, even she pick can't it cook up. in it unless I'm here. I can <laughs> I barely get it out of the oven. have to have him get it out of the oven. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I actually had to go to the antique store two times because I needed to go make sure that it was okay for us to film down there and then go back and film, which means I got to go shopping twice. Yay. <laughs> But she also made a great video for you guys on how to buy cast iron. Yes. Very thorough. So yeah. we'll leave a link below to check that out. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, what have you been up to? Watching the snow melt. <laughs> really, <clears throat> it's just gotten to be Does that it time melt of the year. If you watch it, does it melt faster? No, it melts slower when I watch it. You know, I'm, I'm it, sure of it. It melts slower after you've been on a trip down south yeah. and seen a whole lot of green things. Absolutely. <laughs> While I was in California, I went to see some friends in ministry down in Baja, and that was great, but I was jealous. It was very green, very warm. And uh, so now I'm just at home cheering on the snow and enjoying seeing the melt. Uh, we were just looking at taking stock of fencing right materials today and kind of peeking into the garden can't get in there yet but we can start seeds soon so yes. that's coming that's coming up very soon and you know but it is it's really a lot of daydreaming and planning mm -hmm. and getting ready because as soon as that snow is gone enough and the ground dries out a little bit um then comes the spring we're gonna rush. be running it's gonna be the spring yeah. rush and it's it's um you never know it could be in a couple weeks here it could be in six weeks Honestly, I think this period of anticipation where you get a little antsy, start anticipating, uh -huh. I think that's really healthy for a homesteader because it won't be many weeks before we're like exhausted from the spring rush and going, oh, yeah. 
oh, we need to go back to winter. Well, we, we love the change in seasons. We've still yes. got, uh, you know, a few weeks of good skiing in on the weekends for mm -hmm. the kids. They, they're, they're in ski school. And right. so, you know, we've still got a few winter activities to get in yet. Uh-huh. But uh, we're getting there. I am getting ready for spring. Well, maybe I still owe you a ski date that you, I messed up last time. Yeah, we didn't make that. Yeah, if so. you guys heard that, I ended up injured and not able to go on a, your birthday ski date we were going on. So those double black diamonds, I think, got her a little <laughs> freaked out. I just pretended to be hurt and hidden bed when he said <laughs> well. double black diamond. <laughs> <laughs> we can stay on the blue. Okay. Sounds good. Maybe the green. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that too. All righty. All right. Well, moving along, we better dive into the question of the week, which is from Alex Spitzer on how to fire a wood stove. Okay. I don't know if you guys that saw that video, video, but I just did a video on how to use your wood cook stove, not cook on it, right. not bake in it. Mm -hmm. You're going to do some of those coming up eventually here in the next couple yep. of months, right? Yes. But first, we wanted to get you a video on just how to use it. There's not a lot of detail in there, just how to properly fire. And it's also applicable for even just a wood burning stove. Right. Um, anyway, so it was from that video. And a good question. He says, what do you do with the ash once you take it out? I've heard many things, but I'm curious about its use in the garden. I have heard people swear by it being benef beneficial and others saying it's one of the worst things you could do to a garden. Mm. So that's a really good question because we certainly want to make the most use out of everything that we can. Right. And so what to do with all of that ash. Right. You know, and you know what? Both are true. It can be great for your garden and it can be a nightmare. Yeah. You, know, you can cause a lot of problems. It depends on how you use it. So ash has got um, a lot of potassium in it which okay. is great for the garden. That's an essential mineral, as well as calcium, mm. which can be used like lime. So if you have um, low pH and you need to raise that pH a little bit uh, toward, you know, away from acidity, then you can use that a little bit. But you gotta be careful. You, you can't just go throwing a lot of ash on because you can cause some problems. You can mm -hmm. cause alkalinity. Um, so either you need to do soil tests and find out what your soil needs or use it sparingly. Mm -hmm. Um, some people add it into their compost, break it down a little bit, so that's great. And um, we have found one of our favorite uses for it is it's great for dealing with flea beetles. Yes, around any of the brassicas, huh? Mm -hmm. So any of our broccolis or cabbages or anything like that, we tend to put a little layer of, um, of the ash right on the top of the soil after we plant those in. And those have really helped with pest control yep. around those particular plants. And being our second year on this property <clears throat> and discovering that we have a large flea beetle, Major problem, flea beetle problem, we are going to be using uh, a bit of ash. Yep. But we're going to do some soil tests first mm -hmm. and um, make sure that we're safe to be doing that. We're not adding too much. I'm pretty sure right. we're fine. But So use it carefully and sparingly is really the answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it can be very destructive if you don't use it correctly but it can also be very beneficial and it's one of our favorite uses for ash. Besides, another tip is if you live in a snowy environment, yeah. it can be great for traction. I always yeah. like to have a bucket around in case we're getting a little slick. You can throw that down under your tires if you get stuck or a little bit of a slippery spot, some ice or whatever. Ash is just, it just binds everything up. And well, it's really helpful too, <laughs> especially if your alternative is salt as a de-icer and you're right next to growing beds, wherever your walkway is, and mm -hmm. you don't want to um, salt your growing beds right. and make them hard to grow in, that's a great alternative, is a little bit of ash. Absolutely it is. Very cool. Yeah. All righty. Into the main topic. Shall we get huh? into main topic today? Right. You bet. Okay, so how to grow your best garden ever. Good. How are we going to grow Sorry. our best garden I guess, ever? I guess we'll have to cut that one. <laughs> I thought you would Sorry. pick that up. Um, okay, so how to grow your best garden ever. There's, there's a lot of information out there, really. Absolutely. And nobody can really tell you how to do everything just right in your space. Yeah, you're going to have your very own problems. You're going to have your very own, um, you know, climate, you're going to have everything. Your soil is going to be very individual. So you have to make sure you know what you're doing for your garden. Yeah, too. you're going to have your own advantages. Right. But when I looked this up to just see what other people were talking about, most of them were telling people what vegetables you can grow the best. Oh, okay. And that's great. It's great to know about specific vegetables, but that really depends on your environment as yeah. well. 
So what we wanted to do is just give you some tips that are really going to help you out with your garden wherever you're at. It's just some general principles that if you apply these, they're really going to just boost your game, boost your productivity, mm -hmm. and um, boost, boost your experience in the garden. Right. Good. Right? Yeah. Okay. You ready to dive in? Yep. All righty. Okay. So first one, stop using the chemical fertilizers pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. You need to get rid of them. Yeah, just get, get, take them and dump them out. In fact, when we moved into this place, there was an entire refrigerator mm -hmm. up in the garden shed that was completely filled with chemicals. Absolutely. First time we've had anything like that on our property, I mm -hmm. think ever. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's been at least 15 to 16 years since we've used anything non-organic. Absolutely. And there's a lot of people that argue that you need it to deal with pests and to deal with different issues. And you know what? One of the things you got to realize if you're gardening, there's always going to be challenges and problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. There, there just is no perfect garden. Right. There's no garden with no pests. There's mm -hmm. no garden with no weeds. Right. Um, unless you're maybe doing commercial farming mm -hmm. and spraying, you know, all of this stuff. Right. But it's not good for you. It's absolutely not good for you. But I've got a question here about this because sometimes, let's say you've been using chemicals in your garden for year after year and then mm -hmm. you decide to stop. Yeah. Sometimes that first year garden might be a little bit rougher, right? It might be for a couple of years, might actually. Might be for a couple of years, okay. Right, yeah. You yeah. know, like we've seen a few things in this garden. Thankfully, this garden was covered over. It was plastic for a lot of years. And, mm -hmm. and I think it was very sparingly at this point and a lot of it had gotten a time to wash out. Right. But yes, you can have a lot of challenges. And so you bring up a really good point. You've got to be prepared for that and take the proactive steps. They're going right. to help you get over the hump. Yeah. Um, and it may take a little while. It may take a little while, but you're going to feel a lot better about the produce that you're eating and that you get out of the garden. And so in that way, everything that you raise in a garden that doesn't have the stuff in it is going to be your best garden year ever, even if it's less. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Just, just by doing away with those things. And you will over time find other solutions. Yes. You're going to build healthier soil. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're going to learn um, how to work in your environment better and deter certain pests or work with certain pests. You're going to learn how to deal with weeds so you don't need the herbicides. Right. There's a whole lot of other tools out there and you just, we just want to get rid of that. We just want to stop yeah. and remove it. That is just step number one. Absolutely. And it should be true on your whole property. Just get rid of that stuff. Detox the property. Don't even own it. It's easy to grab for it. If you get in a position where you're like, oh no, you know, there's something attacking the broccoli. Yeah. It's easy to grab for it kind of in desperation. So just get rid of it and move on. Yep. With life. <laughs> and so if you're going to do that, like Carolyn said, there's likely to be some challenges. Right. And so wh where do you go next? Mm -hmm. Next, we want to start developing good soil. Mm -hmm. the, the, your soil is the lifeblood of your garden. You've yeah. got to take care of your soil. Yeah. Yeah. This is really important because, again, if you're talking about the health, the quality of healthfulness of those vegetables that you grow in your garden, if your soil is not good, then you're not going to have the nutrients in your vegetables in order to put them into your body. Absolutely. So if you want the best garden ever, you really need to focus on getting that soil health up so that way you're getting the most effectiveness out of what you do grow. Mm -hmm. And you'll also find that your garden is going to be so much healthier and you're going to have so many fewer problems if you have healthy soil. Well, over time, you'll reduce your pest issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you could probably really expound on this a lot because it's very much the same as physical health. Right. You know, how, how do we deal with disease and deal with issues in our body? Mm -hmm. and instead of going to the pharmacy, instead of going to over the counters, the first thing we want to do is clean house, right? right. So get rid of the chemicals get and start the building stuff. health in our own bodies. Right. And so that's the soil, as we said. So how do we build healthy soil? Right. Number one, <laughs> Good quality compost. You need to get the best quality compost you can into your garden. Most of your gardens are going to be lacking organic matter. They're going to be lacking biological life. Okay, that's big words for people. Maybe just go to the, the hardware store and buy a bag of compost. Is that what we're talking about? Well, you need to get the best quality you can. So a good garden okay. center. If you're not making your own compost yet, and even if you are, making good compost is actually, there's composting and then there's making really high quality compost. Okay, <laughs> there's and, different degrees of and composting. And so 
unless you're really excelling at making good quality compost, and you've been doing it for a while, you really want to get the best quality compost that you can. Okay, so what is the best source for finding really high quality? Like, can you find it at your local hardware store? Is there good quality compost? Uh, whether it's at your local hardware store or not, I don't know, but most areas now have got a good gardening center. Okay. Most of them have organic compost. So organic is what you're looking for. Oh yeah, abs absolutely organic. Okay. And preferably not in the bags. A lot of the bagged potting soils and compost have been sterilized. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's good, it's clean, but it's also devoid of life. Right, so you're not going to have the weed seeds, but you're also not going to have the beneficial bacteria. Right, the biological and the, life. The biological yeah, life. yeah, and that that can be really challenging. So you know we've got to work with what we have, mm -hmm. and so I just want to encourage you guys to find the best that you can, and it's worth the money. Good compost is expensive. Yeah, up here it is in the forty dollars a yard. Oh yeah. So it's okay. pricey, <laughs> but it will but turn really out good. quality vegetables for you. Mm -hmm. And it will build soy health in your soil. It will build your biological uh, profile in your soil. And so you just you just want to do the best you can, and it will pay for itself. Right. So the question is, how much to add? Is what okay. a lot of people ask us. How much compost should I put in on every year? Mm -hmm. Year to year basis, a half inch to one inch of good quality compost is is sufficient. Okay. If you have enough organic material in your soil, mm -hmm. and it's been built up. Uh, the, the real way to find that out is to do a soil test okay. and, and, to see find, how and you can find out the organic matter, organic matter. is in your, your soil and go from there. Mm -hmm. uh, however, a rule of thumb is a half inch to one inch a year. Okay. And if your soil is depleted, if it's really sandy, uh, really full of clay, and you know it doesn't have a lot of organic matter in it, I, I've done up to like four inches in a year. And mm -hmm. I've got a friend in Texas who was starting some large gardens and was doing six inches. Okay, that's a and, lot. Yeah, it was a lot, and but he was doing great with it. Now, you don't wanna do that every year because right. you will end up with too much organic matter. Okay. But getting started, you can do that and, and it just will give you a huge boost. Right. So you gotta be willing to experiment a little bit or you gotta go the really technical route and get a soil test, find out your organic matter, and kind of get a prescription. So this is really like looking at the difference between holistic medicine and allopathic medicine, right? Mm -hmm. When we're looking at building our soil health, we're looking at building like our immune system, our, our health that repels the problems. If you are healthy to begin with, you have robust health, then you're going to be that person who goes to the grocery store in flu season and doesn't come home with the flu, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're going to have that good, robust health. Doing this to your soil, repairing your soil, making it alive and filled with all these things is doing that same thing. Right. You're going to have fewer symptomatic problems once you start getting this holistic, big picture health in order. Right. And that, though, sometimes takes a while to do. Well, it does take a while, and it takes a while to develop that biological activity. And it's actually the biological activity uh, in your soil that releases the minerals and nutrients, which is what we're going to talk about okay. next. And that can take a while to build up. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the um, beliefs in organic gardening is that just by adding compost, you're going to release all the minerals. Okay. And... That's a big discussion. There's right. a lot of back and forth with organic gardeners on whether you need to mineralize or not mineralize. Soil microbiologist, this right. is a really advanced topic. Right, and really even a book I was reading this year by Steve Solomon, diving deep into this, um, he kind of contests the idea that all soils have all the minerals that we need. Okay. Because all geographical areas are different. They have different types of rocks. Right. And so even once you get the biology in there, there's still gonna be you know, excesses of this, lack of this type of mineral. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have had the best experience when we have also mineralized our garden. Yes, Okay. absolutely. Now, the trick is how to do that organically. Yeah. And that is called complete organic fertilizer. All right, we have seen this turn around a garden. We have seen amazing oh, things happening, happen when we have applied this consistently through our gardens. We've yep. had a wonderful growth. And, um, you know, there is a robustness in a plant that is fully mineralized that you don't have in something that's not. It's kind of hard to explain until you take a bite of it and you understand what that tastes like, what that feels like in your body. But you can actually feel, I think you can feel it as a healthier vegetable. Well, you can, and there's been some studies on that. And, um, you know, one of the guys that I've studied, Steve Solomon's actually through his life has gone without it and with it 
and seeing the difference in his health and in, in his, his teeth by mineralizing. And so we've done this a little bit for shorter periods of time. Mm -hmm. And I've gone back to deciding that we want to actually add the minerals, not just the compost. It just makes a huge okay. difference in the nutrient content and the quality of the garden. Right. So complete organic fertilizer is something that you can make yourself. It's got a price tag to it, but it's not super expensive. Okay, because you have to get the different elements. You need to buy, right, right, you need to buy the different elements, and we're not gonna dive into that here, mm -hmm. but I am gonna provide a link for a basic recipe oh, good. based on Steve Solomon's recipe mm -hmm. that's really, really good, that's worked really well for us. Okay. And it's, it's a general mineralization. Now, if you really wanna geek out on this, <laughs> you can get a good soil test. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and that will dive into all the different minerals and you can actually change it very specifically for your soil. And I might get into that one day, I, but right now I've got a lot to do. And you don't have to go that far. Okay. The, the complete organic fertilizer, the recipes that are out there, just give you general broad mineralization and they're gonna work anywhere. We've applied it in sandy soil, we've applied it in clay soil, we've applied right. it in very rocky soil up here. Yes. And it has always done great used correctly. Correct. And that's assuming that you don't have any major, like huge deficiencies mm -hmm. or excesses. Right. And again, a soil test is what's going to help you with that. And, okay. and most of us don't. That, that gets to be an extreme situation. Okay. So let me just recap really quickly. So number one, we need to stop using the chemical fertilizers. Yep. Just all the chemicals. Get rid all of the junk food. Of the junk food, right. There you go. Then we want to make sure we bring in the best quality compost possible. Possible. Right. And, and sorry? Well, I was just going to say that's feeding your soil, that's, that's building it. the bones, building the microbes. Okay. Yeah. And then we also want to mineralize, add those minerals back into our soil. Yep get them in there so that the plants can take them up and give them to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, next you want to give your garden a little protection by mulching. Yes, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Soil is not made to be bare. Just about anywhere in nature except for a desert the soil, the, the um, landscape covers the soil, puts a blanket on it, and this does several things. It prevents erosion. Yes. Okay. It moderates temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. It encourages biological life and protects it. Mm -hmm. And it also can help to suppress weeds. Yeah. So you want to mulch your garden. Preferably, I like to do that with organic materials, mm -hmm. um, but there's also sheet mulches and different kinds of things to do. So just as a, as a basic step and a tip, you want to mulch anywhere that you're not growing really densely, really quickly. Okay. So like if you're growing the way we grow lettuces, yes. you know, we're going to plant that very thick. It's going to grow up quick. It's going to outgrow the weeds, shade them out. It's and that, that is a living right. mulch. So we're okay. not so worried about that. Mm -hmm. But where we're planting corn, squash, and there's a, there's a um, wider pattern of, of seeding and the soil is exposed for a longer period of time before mm -hmm. that all grows in, then we'd like to mulch that. We want to cover the ground. Mm -hmm. And that just really protects your soil and gets this whole system going. Right. Can I add one more thing that that mulch does that we've really seen? Absolutely. Is that it reduces the compaction from walking yes. in your own garden. Yep. And I remember one year we had a large garden. It was a very clay base. It was when we lived out in Tennessee. Mm -hmm and it just rained and rained and rained and nobody could get out in their garden in our in our time, area in our in neighborhood our area. Yep. and our garden was perfectly fine to walk into that uh, mulch just act like a sponge and held on to that extra moisture mm -hmm. and it protected the soil beneath yep. it and so it can really help you in that in between season when maybe you might have mud or you might have heavy clay Absolutely. you might have these different things it can help your soil to be workable earlier because of holding on and moderating that moisture. Yeah, and especially like you, you want it on your beds, but having your pathways even built up thicker yes. is great. It's really helpful. So we've got very thick mulch on our beds, our permanent mm -hmm. raised beds that we designed and set up this year. A lot of that mulch this year is gonna come out because it's very thick out into the pathways okay. as we need to get it out of our way in certain areas to plant. Okay. And um, it's- So then we'll have thick walkway. Oh yeah, shape. right, and it'll do yeah. what you're saying. You can go out there in a heavy rain. Now we don't have the clay soil, and so that was really beneficial there. Right. Um, but it's, it's a huge aid. Yeah. So, okay, we've got a couple more and we gotta okay. move on because we're right. getting down okay. there on time. Now, we've dealt with getting rid of the junk food and really building up the health. That right there, if you'll just do all of those things, are, is just gonna, the health of your garden is gonna explode whatever you're growing. It, but, okay. Sorry, I won't sidetrack you. Okay. Yes. But if <laughs> if you really want to do well, 
especially starting out, you need to focus on the vegetables that grow well in your area. Yes, this is a big one. Stop trying to grow everything that doesn't grow in your area. They're well, not we, we've, grow well. we've done this and we have this romantic <laughs> idea of what a garden should look like, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, we live up north, tomatoes don't do as well. Right. Cucumbers don't do as well. Okra really doesn't do as well. <laughs> doesn't mean we're not gonna grow some of those things, but do we want to focus on those? Do we want to put all our energy into those when a lot of root crops do well, when a lot of brassicas do well? Yeah. Likewise, if you're down in the hot and dry, mm -hmm. you know, your brassicas aren't going to do so well. You're going to, you're going to have a harder time. Not that you can't grow them and come up with some good strategies and right. some shading and same with lettuces and things that don't like as much heat, but you're probably not going to want to focus on them as much, especially early on. Mm -hmm. You really need to know your area and focus on what does well in your area, maybe even what your soil leans, leans towards and right. does well with. So that may take some experimentation, some um, understanding your climate. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, talking to your neighbors. So now I am going to sidetrack you and say the thing okay. that I was going to say before is that doing all these different things not only are going to give you a more productive garden, but over time they're actually going to reduce your workload. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's really important. If you've ever started a garden and then just gotten completely overwhelmed by it and, you know, it ended up as a jungle of weeds and you weren't really there taking care of it because you just couldn't keep up with it, it's really important to use the methods that are going to reduce your workload so that you can keep going out and harvesting even if your time gets crunched. Right. Well, the other thing is you're building resilience into the garden when you're building soil health, right. when you're planting things that do well naturally in your area it's going to deal with drought better. Yeah. It's going to deal with a little bit of neglect when you get mm -hmm. busy. I know for us, August is always so tough. It's yeah, where it's I start to time. lose the weeds. Yeah. It's <laughs> where it's the hottest, them. things mm -hmm. dry out, different things struggle. It's where the harvest is really starting to kick in. Yeah. And that's a very tough time. So you want as much resiliency. Sometimes things happen in life. We've mm -hmm. had times in life where we've had to just step away from the garden. Yeah. yeah, it's gotten unruly and overgrown, but because there was good, healthy soil and things were set up right, we still we got a good harvest, go harvest out of it. Out right. Of it. May yeah. not have been as much if the weeds wouldn't have gotten so big or it wouldn't have gone without water at times as much, right. but we still did very well. So you're building that resilience in by taking these steps. Well, and the reality is, is those times are the times where you really need your garden. Usually when life gets crazy, <laughs> right. when right. you don't feel well, when people get sick, whatever the circumstances in life, that's when you really need your garden out there working for you. So you can just wander out and go get dinner real quick and, you know, get it on the table. Right. And so that's really important to build that resiliency in. Absolutely. Okay. So we've got one more. We've, these these are really just the foundational ones. These ones, whatever you do, are just going to build health and they're just going to improve your garden and it's just going to get better every year. And I want to really encourage you, if you are moving away from chemicals, if you are on a first piece of ground, don't be discouraged mm -hmm. by, um, you know, whatever your best efforts are and applying as much of this as you can. It takes three to four years to really get a garden into stride if it hasn't been getting used right. regularly. And so don't be discouraged. Just know that these things work. Yes. And lastly, have a plan. Ah. <laughs> okay, we've talked about this. Mm -hmm. We've done a couple of videos lately on yes. garden planning. And every successful garden's got to have a plan. You can't just decide to go buy what seeds look good and, and till up a row and plant stuff. You right. really want to think about it. You want to think about all these items, but then your planting schedule and your harvest schedule. And you just really want to have a good plan. Yeah, including a watering plan mm -hmm. and a weeding plan. Right, yeah. We I talked didn't... about that before, about a weeding plan. Know ahead how you're going to handle your weeds, right? right. Have an idea. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and know how you're going to water. You know, on average, most vegetables in the garden need about an inch a week. That's a general rule of thumb, okay. an inch of water a week. Know how you're going to get that there. Know how you're going to get that there when you get busy, or is it going to mm -hmm. be automated? You know, how are you going to manage that? Right. So planning, just wanted to end with that. Planning super important. And of course, um, if you guys have haven't seen us talk about this, get uh, Clyde's Garden Planner. Yeah. This is our favorite, very simple tool. Just mm -hmm. did a video on this. We'll provide a link below on how to use this. Right. This is a great starting place. Mm -hmm. as, as you learn your own environment, you're going to add to the knowledge in one of these. Right. But really, really good tool for just getting started on planning. That and a notebook is, is mm -hmm. really, really what you need, really what you need to yeah. get started with a little bit of information. All right. So guys, I'm just going to recap real Good. quick here because okay. I just want to emphasize this. Get rid of the chemicals. Get the best compost you can. Learn about mineralizing. Mm -hmm. Make sure you put some clothes on your garden. <laughs> Mulcher, right? Okay? Take care of her. And uh, 
grow the vegetables that do well in your area first and foremost. Right. And then branch out into that. And your garden, it'll be the best you've ever had and it'll just get better year after year. Yeah. Good. That is going to be really helpful. Yep. I think All right. That'll help a lot of people. So good. Next week. I don't know if we can say what we have coming up for next week yet. Oh, that's a surprise. We? I we, don't... We, we're tr- we might have a special guest for you guys that I think you're going to be really, oh, that's really excited right. yep. about. Yep. Um, but you know how those things go. Okay, so can we tell everybody what's coming up next week? I think so. It's pretty solid. Is it? Okay. All right. Because we have a special guest coming in I'm really excited for you guys to get to hang out with. I think I'll be bowing out and letting Josh hang out with him, with you guys. Yeah, a friend of ours named Casimir is going to come and join us. And Mm -hmm. he is an orchard expert and uh, a fruit and nut enthusiast, as I was noticing on (laughs) on, uh, uh, his email or something. And he really is. And he's uh, also great at pruning trees. So we're going to do some tree pruning here on the property. Okay. And in the pantry chat, we're going to be talking about planning a small kind of homestead orchard. You got, this guy goes around to the old homesteads in this area, the ones that have been abandoned for like 80 years, and he collects yep. the genetic material from the trees that are just have taken care of themselves that long and are just sitting there producing fruit, and he's propagating them. So this is so exciting to me because he's actually putting out these sometimes even unnamed heirloom varieties back into our community. Right. And we're going to be growing a lot of them here on the property. We already have a few I on the property. I'm so excited yep. about this. And we're going to so be neat. developing probably a whole orchard yeah. uh, or on so, this concept. Yes. Yeah. So hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit next week. Um, hey, it's been great hanging out with you yeah. guys. And have a good week, and we will see you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.